and uh, Claudia, yeah. We're all here, uh, the six uh, uh, members of the committee. And uh, uh, actually due to the uh, COVID-19, the seminar series has uh, been held online weekly and since August of the 2020. It aims to uh, present and discuss recent uh, developments and the future uh, direction on both theoretical and the experimental sites uh, related to heavy ion collisions at weak beamless scan energies. And uh, in the last year, we have uh, successfully uh, com complete uh, the weak beamless scan uh, sem uh, seminar series three, uh, actually, which has the uh, 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 from the uh, phase four folding uh, with well over 100 regular participants every week, and sometimes more than 200. So here, and on behalf of the organizing committee, I'd like to announce the fourth uh, seminar series on weak beam scan and get started today. And uh, we actually feel very happy and honored that our first talk is uh, featured by uh, Professor Frank Grochek. And he will uh, talk about uh, the uh, actions uh, from deep QCT and to cosmology and a uh, new search strategy. And we also have uh, very happy to have uh, Professor Lee Hens. He has kindly agreed to chair the seminar. So now I'd like to hand the time to Uli. Yeah, please. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, we promised Frank uh, 60 minutes, so I will keep this brief here. Uh, according to his website, Frank Wilczek is a theoretical physicist, chromo technologist, intellectual adventurer, and author. In 1973, he, is, he uh, announced his arrival on the physics scene with a PhD thesis on asymptotic freedom in non abelian gauge theories, which ultimately won him the Nobel Prize. In 1977, he studied the Petrie Quinn solution of the strong CP problem and showed that the spontaneous breaking of the Petrie Quinn symmetry results in a new particle, the axion, which is the subject of today's seminar. In 1982, he introduced the name anions for quasi particles in two dimensional quantum field theories that are neither bosons nor fermions. And then he later showed them to play a key role in the fractional quantum Hall effect discovered in the same year. Uh, Frank invented time crystals in 2012, and in a continuous stream of path-breaking work, he made fundamental contributions to particle physics, nuclear physics, where he and colleagues discovered color flavor locking and the color superconductivity in QCD matter at high density and low temperature, and he also clarified the phase transition, the chiral phase transition in QCD and the critical point in the phase diagram to condensed matter physics including the condensed matter physics of QCD and much, much more. He won the MacArthur Genius Award in 1982, the Dirac Medal, the Julius Edgar Lindenfeld Prize, King Faisal Prize, and of course, the Nobel Prize, which he shared with David Gross and David Pollitzer. And he's a member of the National Academy of Science. He has written many popular books and popular science columns which all shine with the exceptional clarity of his thought and language. And we are thrilled to have him here in our seminar today and looking forward to, the, uh, to, uh, to his presentation. And before I give hand over the, um, the word, the, the ground rules are, please, if you have questions, please type them into chat. I will monitor the chat if the question is something that should be urgently uh, uh, responded to, 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 to so that the, uh, the talk is uh, stays continuous. I will interrupt Frank, but otherwise I will collect those questions for the question and answer session at the end. So Frank, now you are ready to go. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, very flattering introduction. And um, let me share my screen in the appropriate way. There, so I hope you see a, uh, a blank white screen. Is that right? And you, you can do. Hear okay. So thanks, thank you again, Yuli, for, for that lovely introduction. And it's, it's a great pleasure to uh, be talking across continents 
and uh, and have such a such a, a, a lively audience. Um, I will be talking today about something that is a little to the side of uh, heavy ion physics, uh, but it has a common source uh, in the deep structure of QCD. And, and, and there certainly are aspects of it that get illuminated by heavy ion physics. Uh, I'm looking very much forward to uh, the, the, the uh, results from recent experiments at, at RIC that will elucidate the phase diagram, but we don't have them yet. Uh, and, uh, and, what, and what I've actually been working on uh, that's mostly related to, to, to uh, QCD and the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, intellectual problems that arise from it uh, in recent times is, is axions and in particular uh, trying to finally observe the darn particles. And, and I think we're making very significant progress on that and I'd like to share that with you. But, since not everyone has uh, been uh, with the subject as long as I have, uh, or paying as paying as much attention as I have, uh, maybe it makes sense, uh, given that uh, we have people with different backgrounds and, uh, and people that, that train and experiment mostly, uh, to uh, start more or less from scratch. And uh, I will have be able to start from scratch and give you at least a uh, highlight introduction to several of the uh, outstanding uh, features of the, the landscape around axions. There's a lot I won't be able to cover. So uh, let me give you, uh, in this outline also have mentioned very briefly uh, some items that uh, are in parentheses here that I won't talk about. So first I'll discuss why fundamental axions, fundamental physics needs axions. Then I'll discuss what axions are in the language of particle physics and especially their electromagnetic interactions, which are interesting and the basis of uh, many experimental searches that, that I'll want to uh, discuss. Then I'll discuss uh, an unexpected gift uh, from the early days of axion physics, which is that uh, axions could also, although this wasn't what they were originally designed for, uh, they also may very well uh, provide the dark matter that cosmologists need. There's a lot to say about axions and astrophysics, astrophysical sources, especially uh, uh, neutron star environments, also black holes uh, can be uh, useful probes of axion physics, uh, but I won't have time to discuss that. Uh, there are a number of laboratory uh, uh, Limitate uh, axion ax, axion inspired or axion uh, constrained experiments that look for long range forces and and other things in the laboratory, but again I won't be able to talk about those. I will talk, however, about uh, attempts to identify to uh, actually observe the uh, axions if they're the dark matter. This is called these are called haloscopes in general. The haloscope means something designed to discuss the dark, to uh, observe the dark matter halo in which we're embedded. Uh, and I'll discuss in particular a new idea that we, we've been very, very actively pursuing and looks extremely promising called the plasma haloscope. And uh, then I'll only mention in passing what's become a thriving industry in condensed matter physics. That is, uh, what I call emergent axions. These are collective excitations inside matter that uh, obey the equations of axions, of course, with uh, different 
uh, interpretations of what the symbols in the equations mean, but uh, they, they have very characteristic physics, which is shared by axions, but by the uh, fundamental axions, uh, and they display it in a much more accessible context. And this has become, as I said, a thriving uh, discipline within condensed matter physics with actual data as well as as well as nice idea. Mm -hmm. Okay, so without further ado, uh, yes, as I said, I won't be able to talk about all these things and all of them except the emergent stuff can be dis is is uh, discuss is contained with I think hundreds, maybe maybe over a thousand references in, in in some standard review articles. Okay, so quickly, why does fundamental physics need axions? And this is uh, brought forth in a very understandable and dramatic way uh, through a series of why questions. The Time reversal symmetry of basic of the basic equations of physics has been a strange but notable property of the fundamental laws of physics for several centuries, starting with Newtonian mechanics, where uh, basically you have accelerations related to position dependent forces. And uh, since accelerations are uh, quadratic, in, in times, when you reverse the sign of the time, you get the same equations. Uh, but in, and if you imagine running the solar system backwards in time, it still obeys the Newtonian uh, celestial mechanics. Uh, and that strange property, which is certainly not necessary to describe experience, the ordinary experience is, is anything but time reversal symmetric. And we, remember the past and only guess about the future, for instance, uh, that, that, that strange property continued through general relativity and quantum mechanics as physics evolved, included more and more phenomena. Uh, this strange property remained, remained in the fundamental equations. Why? Uh, as long as it appeared to be an exact fundamental feature, it was unclear that asking why would be fruitful. Uh, sometimes if you have a, a beautiful principle, that's just the way it is, that's rock bottom and can't be explained in terms of anything simpler or more beautiful. And time, time reversal symmetry might have been in that category. But uh, the situation changed in 1964 at Brookhaven, actually, when uh, uh, Jim Cronin, Val Fitch, and their collaborators dis discovered a subtle effect in K maze on decays that slightly violates T. Actually, uh, what they discovered was uh, a violation of CP symmetry, charge conjugation times spatial parity. But there are very good reasons to think that CPT is, is a precise symmetry, and so violation of CP is equivalent to violation of T. And subsequently actual T violation has been observed in other experiments. So T symmetry is definitely rock, not rock bottom. It's not even quite true. And that makes it even more puzzling. Why is it approximately, but not exactly true? And remarkably, uh, we've almost nailed it. We've almost solved this ancient problem at the foundations of physics in the following way. It turns out that the basic, uh, I'll say sacred principles of modern physics, uh, uh, relativity plus quantum mechanics plus the local symmetry that underpins the standard model are very powerful when you act in when they act together. Now, I put sacred in quotation marks. Of course, this is science, it's not, uh, not religion. And uh, uh, in principle, nothing is a sacred principle, but uh, 
these concepts of relativity, quantum mechanics, and local symmetry explain so much and appear to be so profound that uh, we would have a lot to unlearn if we found that they were violated. And they certainly seem to be more profound and therefore a basis for discussion of uh, time reversal symmetry as, as a consequence of that. So we would be happy if we explain time reversal symmetry based on these more fundamental principles. And uh, acting together in the framework of relativistic quantum field theory, they constrain the possible interactions very powerfully. And in fact, when you analyze it, you find that in the standard model, uh, there are exactly two possible sources of T violation. Uh, one of them, uh, discovered and elucidated by Kobayashi and Maskawa, beautifully explains what Cronin and Fitch observed in K mesons and a lot more in uh, to weak decays of heavy quarks, especially. Uh, but the other, the others, the second possibility, uh, the second consistent interaction doesn't happen. Uh, here I elaborate a bit on what the interactions are, but in view of the limited time, I won't. And, and uh, since this is probably well known to this audience, I won't belabor uh, this. Uh, and it's kind of a side issue for. For the for the for what follows, uh, the CKM phenomenology uh, of T violation works very well. Uh, the other term, the one that doesn't happen, is something that's intrinsic to QCD. It's a coupling of uh, gluon fields to each other in the form of an electric times magnetic. Uh, dot product, this self-interaction of colored gluons uh, is non-trivial in the quantum theory of chromodynamics, even though in the classical theory, it's a uh, formally a total derivative. So it's a deep property of quantum field theory that this interaction has non-trivial effects, but uh, we know, for instance, that if it didn't, uh, it, 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 then uh, the eta meson would be, or eta prime meson would be much lighter than it is. So this interaction, you know, both theoretically and sort of numerically and experimentally is a necessary component of QCD. Uh, or the fact that E dot B uh, interaction fluctuations affect the uh, behavior of gluons. However, uh, this term as a fundamental interaction as opposed to a fluctuation is very dangerous because uh, it changes sign under time reversal. So, it vi so a non-zero angle of the theta parameter here, the non-zero value of this coefficient would break time reversal symmetry within QCD. And uh, this doesn't involve heavy quarks or any exotic weak interactions. This is just uh, hardcore QCD. And so uh, a non-zero value of theta feeds more or less directly into the electric dipole moment of the neutron, a famous T violating effect. And the only thing that keeps it small in in uh, in in the world is, in fact, the, the fact that it violates T symmetry. So the experimental limits on the neutron electric dipole moment have been uh, improved over the years. It's been a, a major enterprise of experimental physics to try to measure this electric dipole moment, but so far the results are all negative and interpreted in terms of the theta parameter, they limit its possible values to less than a part in 10 billion. Why? So now we have a numerical 
coincidence or numerical uh, fact that's a very uh, impressive quantitatively. And to me, it's much too tight to be uh, explained away as a coincidence. Over the past, so, so that's, the, that's sometimes called the strong CP problem or the strong T problem or just the theta problem. Over the past 40 years, 40 plus years now, uh, since these aspects of QCD were first uh, properly understood, there have been several attempts to explain why theta is so small, but only one has survived uh, detailed scrutiny and stood the taste, test of time. Uh, what happened, what we do, and I'll, I'll fill in a little bit more of the technical details uh, momentarily, what we do is promote the unwanted coupling constant, that theta, which within the standard model itself is just a number, we promote it to a dynamical entity, a field, something that can change in time. So instead of a number, instead of a coupling constant, theta uh, within an expanded version of the standard model becomes a field. Uh, and if you set things up right with the appropriate kind of symmetry, the so-called peche quinn symmetry, then uh, this dynamical entity this, uh, that you add to the standard model wants to evolve to zero, wants to evolve to uh, a value that wants to settle down to a very uh, a value that's very nearly zero, uh, a value at which time reversal symmetry is uh, very well maintained. Not exactly, but very, very well. Uh, this then, then would explain the otherwise mysterious coincidence. It's a remarkable concept because it really brings the idea of evolution of what on the face of it seems like a constant of nature uh, into physics. So it's a theory of evolution now, not for animal species, but for the constants of nature. Uh, here's a picture of it that I, li that I like. So back in the early universe, you have a field that starts out in some excited states, but as the excited state, but as the universe cools and expands, it can lose energy and spiral down to its minimum energy, uh, which is uh, attained when the effective value of the theta parameter is very nearly zero. Now, to implement this idea, we had to introduce a new quantum, a new quantum field. Uh, the, the, uh, the theta parameter became a field. And that field, like all quantum fields, uh, creates particles. The electromagnetic field can, creates photons. The uh, electron field produces pions and uh, photons and uh, <laughs> electrons and positrons and so forth. Uh, those are the basic ingredients of our picture of the world. And uh, this new field is no exception. When you apply the principles of quantum mechanics to it, you find that it makes new a particle. And the particle I called the axion inspired by a laundry detergent because it cleans up a problem. And well, they're actually, yeah, this is actually how the name rolls. <laughs> okay, let's go through this a little more technically. So the standard model divides into two sectors, the gauge sector and the flavor or Higgs sector. The gauge sector is tightly principled and brilliantly successful. Uh, the flavor sector is much looser. Uh, it's been very successful in correlating data, you know, that organizing data about the masses of different quarks and how the, which one decays into the other, and similarly for leptons. Uh, but it has many phenomenological input parameters. 
its most striking success, in fact, is the Kobayashi Nasukawa theory of T violation, I think. And the Nobel Committee agreed with that. That's what, uh, but uh, as I discussed, there's a serpent in the garden. The, this explanation of T violation in the world is not complete because uh, although the uh, some of the non-zero phases one uh, are within the are explained in terms of the uh, Kobayashi Maskawa scheme. Uh, the overall phase of the quark mass matrix, which is also physically meaningful, uh, is related to this theta parameter. In fact, it's essentially the same thing uh, if you use the so-called anomaly equation or the axial current, axial barrier number current in QCD. And uh, as we mentioned, it's very small. So Kobayashi Maskawa pick out some of the angles to be uh, important, uh, but one of them is set to zero. It seems like a very uh, conspiratorial uh, idea if you think about it this way. And this to me is the most striking unnatural feature of the standard model. That is an unexplained numerical coincidence aside from the very tiny value of the uh, cosmological term or, or uh, dark energy. Uh, I should say that whereas for the cosmological term, people have appealed to anthropic reasoning that if the cosmological term were much bigger, uh, we wouldn't be around to observe it. Uh, whatever you think of that argument, it doesn't work for the theta parameter because the theta parameter could be much, much larger than it is without significantly affecting any aspect of everyday life. So you could perfectly well have uh, observers in a universe that had non-zero values, much larger values of theta than, than we have in our world. Okay a little bit more about the actual symmetry. Uh, so you want to be able to have uh, dynamical degrees of, degrees of freedom that allow you to rotate away the, by field redefinitions, the uh, phase of the quark mass matrix And if you do that, if you look at the source of the physical source of energy dependence on theta, it comes from instantons in QCD. You can also analyze it more abstractly, but it's nice to have a picture and then, then you, have, you can do that in terms of instantons. Uh, and if you have this kind of contribution to the vacuum energy, with uh, weighted by a phase, e to the i theta, and then the anti version gets an e to the minus i theta, so it's altogether uh, cosine. And uh, you minimize at uh, uh, theta equals to zero. So you actually minimize the energy when theta equals zero, where theta here is the relative phase between two Higgs fields, one of which couples only to right-handed quarks, the other up quarks, the other of which couples only to right-handed down quarks. So that implements this idea that, uh, that you have a dynamical degree of freedom. Here it's the relative phase between these two different Higgs fields that, uh, that responds to the value of theta directly and is minimized when the effective value of that degree of freedom, that field uh, is close to zero. Okay. There are other ways of doing it that are even, that are even more elegant, uh, but I won't, uh, I won't have time to discuss that.
Okay, so this is the same idea here. Phi is the relative uh, uh, value of, of the two uh, phases. So here, so in terms of the preceding diagram, it would be uh, phi one times phi two dagger, it would be an emergent degree of freedom from the two Higgs fields and you have their relative phase phi, a relative phase field uh, phi, of the magnitude and phase, but the phase, <laughs> phase is, uh, is uh, the phase of phi one, phi two. And uh, when you have an expectation value for that, you get uh, a spontaneous breaking of uh, the, this, the underlying symmetry and then uh, then you get to minimize and go down to AD equals zero. But there's a residual quantum field that takes is flux, that uh, carries very little energy cars compared to the very large symmetry breaking scale F. The, 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 there's one that can, can, uh, is associated with the QCD scale, uh, namely, uh, rotations of this uh, instanton phase. And uh, that gives you a, a, a degree of freedom with very small mass. And that's the axiom. Uh, F, the magnitude of the condensate parameters is the stiffness of the axion field. If you now, if you think about the kinetic energy for phi and write it in this form, you realize that uh, the A field is now, the A field's kinetic energy, when you take the gradient and square it, uh, the F's cancel and, and you don't get it. Uh, but uh, all the couplings of the axion field will occur in the form A over F. So if F is very, very large, if it's a large mass scale, the axion field will be weakly coupled or putting it another way, the underlying field of which it's the phase oscillation is very, very stiff. Okay. And I won't be going through these technicalities, but uh, it's important to note that they exist, that, uh, that symmetry dictates the exact form of, of the axion coupling. So we can be pretty concrete about the properties of this particle that we predict, even though uh, the actual data on it is uh, very non-existent. <laughs> so here come the properties. The crucial ones are the mass, the spin, and the interactions. And Here we can write those things down in a convenient way. Uh, so we have an ordinary spin zero field with a non-zero mass, that's the axiom. Uh, its mass, as I said, is associated with the QCD scale, but suppressed by that stiffness of, uh, of the underlying uh, condensate from which it arose. And so the mass of the axion is lambda QCD squared, uh, which numerically will be of the, is of the order of 100 MeV squared, uh, divided by F. And F, as we'll see, is something that uh, will be uh, 10 to the 10 GeV or greater. So will be very, uh, associated with unification scales with very much, very much larger scales. So that will make the axion a uh, very weakly coupled particle, uh, a very light particle, and but and as I said, we can write to, we can write down the theory in terms of one basic parameter f, which governs both the mass and the couplings. Here is what the couplings look like. So there are couplings to gauge fields, and there are also couplings to leptons of a very specific form. They're all inversely proportional to F, 
So as the axion, as F gets larger, the axion gets lighter and more weakly coupled. There are numerical coefficients of order unity that depend on the details of the charge assignments of the different quarks and leptons under the symmetry. Uh, they're of order one. So we have one basic parameter in the theory and then other order one uh, uh, refinements that are somewhat model dependent. The electromagnetic part is especially elegant. You can uh, separate that part out and analyze the modifications of the Maxwell equations that you get from the presence of the axion field. This is where you find equations that it turns out also describe situations in condensed matter physics. So nature also likes these equations. And uh, the, they, uh, they, are, they are central to several search strategies. So let me uh, display, oops, I wanted to display what they are. I guess I didn't. So, uh, took away a slide that I shouldn't have. So uh, the basic coupling is uh, from which you can derive axion electrodynamics is the coupling of the axion to uh, the electromagnetic field. This is what it looks like in relativistic notation. This is what it looks like in common notation. So it's axion E dot B. So it's very analogous to the coupling uh, to gluons, which is the, the reason for postulating the axion in the first place, uh, you also get a coupling of a very similar form to the electromagnetic field, E dot B. And you can just see what this gives as a modification to the Maxwell equations. It's an exercise in uh, analytic mechanics. That's very fun to do. And this is what you get. And it has remarkable effects. What you find that in the presence of an axion field and in, in with a spatial gradient, then an external magnetic field will induce effectively a charge. On the right-hand side of this Maxwell equation is the charge as, as far as the electric, electric field is concerned. That's the definition of charge. So what you have is a magnetic field uh, in the presence of an axion gradient induces charge. Uh, you also have that a time-dependent axion field, even if it's spatially homogeneous, uh, induces similarly in the presence of a magnetic field an effective current. And this is the basis of many, many search strategies for the axion, uh, including the one I'll just be describing in more detail later. Uh, and then you have another contribution to the uh, effective current, proportional spatial gradient of the axion. Uh, this gives a kind of Hall effect that an electric field, a voltage induces a magnetic field, or it induces a current. Uh, and this is something that's uh, very much studied in the context of emergent axions and convex matter. Okay, so we'll come back to that. These are, these are quite wonderful equations. Let me see how I'm doing for time, not very well. So uh, I'll go through the, how axions make dark matter. Uh, I'll try to accelerate a bit.
so remember this picture, the basic axion dynamics is that in the early universe, you have a field that starts out in a more or less random place. And then it spirals down as the universe evolves and cools, can take energy away from this uh, excited field. And it settles down to its energy minimum, which is theta very close to zero, but There are small residual oscillations. They're numerically very small, much smaller than that 10 to the minus 10, which was the experimental limits. They're more like 10 to the minus 14 or 15, if I remember correctly. Uh, so they don't upset the uh, mission of the axion to explain the phenomenological observed smallness of the theta parameter, uh, but even though they're very small numerically, because the underlying field is so stiff, they represent quite a lot of energy. In fact, you can analyze these oscillations using the interpretation of uh, fields as quanta, just like electromagnetic fields are made out of photons. These residual oscillations are, uh, produ are, produ are collections of particles and that's exactly the cause, that is the cosmic axion background. It turns out that if you follow through the uh, Big Bang cosmology of this settling down of the, of, the, of the field to its minimum, there are residual oscillations and they correspond to a residual mass density that's roughly proportional to F, it turns out. Not exactly, but very nearly. Now, uh, axion cosmology in detail branches into two parts. One is conventional cosmology. In conventional cosmology, uh, the universe today uh, samples many, many independent uh, regions that uh, at the time when the axion field uh, first uh, condensed, when the underlying scalar field of which the axion field is the phase uh, first condensed. Uh, that's because as the universe gets older, uh, the speed of light times the age of the universe, which is basically how far any observer can see in the universe, gets bigger and bigger. Or in the, in the jargon of cosmology, you say the horizon gets bigger and bigger. Reading it the other way, in the past, the horizon was much, much smaller. And so uh, different regions that we get to see today didn't see each other back then. So they were independent. And therefore, the initial displacement of that uh, field in, in the picture of, of the field rolling down, the initial angular dependence, which winds up being the, uh, what winds up being translated into the residual oscillations around the minimum, uh, gets a, is, is a random variable that we should average over because we average over many independent samples when we look out at the sky. And that takes care of the relevant unknown parameter in, in the cosmology, the unknown initial condition. That was the only thing that was really uh, uncertain. And since we're supposed to average over it, when we take large samples of the universe, we can calculate how much, what value of F remember the density is proportional to F roughly, uh, what value of F it takes to make the observed dark matter. And it turns out to be roughly F equals 10 to the 12 GeV. Now, uh, as I'll flash later, there are tremendous, a lot of effort has been putting, put into searching for axions and there are uh, experimental constraints now uh, 
from astrophysics and accelerator physics that say F has to be greater than 10 to the 10th GeV. Remember the strength of axion coupling goes down as F increases. So as you get better constraints on the possible coupling, uh, the F parameter gets big, uh, that's allowed, that it gets bigger and bigger. Uh, based on existing accelerator and astrophysical limits, you have F equals to or greater than 10 to the 10th GeV. Uh, here, you need 10 to the 12th GeV to make the dark matter. Uh, so if axions exist at all, the constraints tell you pretty much that it has to be the dark matter. So if we're going to solve the strong CP problem, this is the problem of why time reversal is so good, but not exact in the world, uh, we're really pretty much forced to the idea that axions provide a lot and maybe all of the dark matter. Okay, so this is a picture of in, in, in intended to illustrate that in the early universe, you had many different uh, initial values of theta that translate into many different samples of uh, axion density that average to uh, a calculable value. And here's a very recent impressive uh, attempt to uh, get translate all that into a numerical expectation for the axion mass. I should say that work in QCD, especially in lattice gauge theory, is crucial to relating the values that the, the parameters that appear in cosmology, F in particular, uh, to the predicted axion mass, which is relevant for experiments, as you'll see. Uh, and so uh, this is a very direct uh, connection between sophisticated work in QCD and, uh, and axion physics. And when you put cosmology together with uh, the, the QCD, uh, in this scenario, you get a fairly precise range of possible values for the axion mass. And we'll see why that's important momentarily. If we translate it into a frequency, which is very convenient for experimental purposes when you think about how you're going to make an antenna that tunes into the axion background. It's uh, uh, in the uh, range of several tens of gigavolts, uh, gigahertz. Okay, uh, there's another possibility that uh, in between when the condensate formed and the present day in cosmology, inflation occurred. But in view of the time, I won't say anything more about that. Except that in this scenario also, it's very hard, it's even harder actually, to avoid uh, significant axion dark matter if axions exist at all. So whichever way you go, if axions exist, they have to be a big part of the dark matter. And then Occam's razor suggests they're essentially all, that they are essentially all of it. Okay, so now let me get to the recent exciting developments in uh, ex uh, experimental and, and designing uh, antennas that seem to be capable of uh, doing the job of, of detecting axions if they're there. Uh, remember here, here are the equations again, and we're going to use this term, especially. It's the largest because it turns out that interpreted as particles, axions today are highly non-relativistic. They've cooled down through the evolution of the universe. And that means that the time rate of change, which is governed by the mass, is much larger than the spatial rate of change, which is governed by the momentum. 
So uh, this is the big term. And if you want to design uh, experiments to find axions, unless there's some very powerful reason, uh, you gain a factor of a thousand by focusing on this term rather than that or, or that one. So that's what we do. Okay, so putting the effect of those equations into words so that we can have some intuition about it. We say, see that in the presence of a background magnetic field, an axion field mixes with the photon. It changes the Maxwell equation. It has the same, it, it, it uh, appears in the same equations as, as the electromagnetic field and mixes with it. And if the axion field is changing with time, it can pump energy into electromagnetic fields. Uh, and the design of antennas is just trying to encourage this pumping effect and then uh, turn uh, axion energy into electromagnetic energy, which you can then detect by all the tricks of uh, electromagnetic and microwave engineering. And because the intrinsic cu the couplings are so weak, in order to get detectable effects, it's important to exploit every trick in the book and in particular uh, resonance. So you want, want to make uh, the pumping efficient, if you like, or you want in particle physics language to make the uh, axion field convert into photons efficiently. Uh, now, if we think about the impedance match, so to speak, or the, uh, the resonance condition, uh, we see that we're in trouble because the axion is, as I said, uh, almost at rest in the, in, the, in, in the cosmos. So it's a massive particle. The mass is small, but still not zero and corresponds to uh, gigahertz frequencies, as we saw. Uh, whereas a photon uh, has energy and momentum that are equal, so they can't match. And putting in a background magnetic field doesn't, doesn't change either the energy or the momentum uh, of the things going through it, so, so you're stuck. So we need to do something more in order to uh, get the conversion to go. Uh, Previous experiments, uh, things like the ADMX experiment, the uh, haystack, and, and others with uh, have been based on being axions momentous language. So you set up cavities or set up inhomogeneous uh, uh, materials that uh, give the cosmic axions a kick and, and, and allow them to uh, match the energy and momentum of uh, a photon and convert resonantly. But there's a different approach. If you think about it, a different approach suggests itself, which is a photon of mass. If you give the photon a mass, then you match without giving the axion a kick. And that's advantageous because it allows you to use home spatial structures. You don't have to give homogeneities uh, that break translation invariance and give the uh, You give the photon a mass and then that can be something that's uniform in space and take advantage of the uh, take better advantage of the fact that the axions uniformly put in space. So how do you give the photon a mass? That seems pretty strange, but actually there are many situations known in physics where photons get a mass. Maybe the most 
famous because it, in, in particle physics closely related to uh, the Higgs mechanism is that inside superconductors, photons have a mass and really all of superconducting phenomenology follow that, that inside a superconductor, the photon becomes a massive field. But that's no good for our purposes is because uh, we want to be we want to apply large external fields to encourage the axion mixing and uh, superconductors don't like large magnetic fields. Another place in which photons get mass is in a plasma. That's the famous plasma mass. Uh, but ordinary plasmas made from hot gases like the things you see in neon signs uh, they're not suitable because the, uh, they're not a suitable environment for making sensitive measurements. They're very noisy, high temperature, and so forth. But there's another kind of plasma where you have free electrons uh, inside metals. And, you, and in there, too, you get so-called plasmons, where the, the photon has essentially acquired a mass, the equations that it appears like the photon is a part of the mass. Uh, unfortunately, that's not quite suitable either because it turns out that with uh, existing, with uh, available metals, uh, the plasma masses are too big. <laughs> they are larger than, than you want for axion purposes. Uh, you kind of know this uh, without knowing it because maybe because uh, uh, a famous effect of uh, the plasma mass in metal is that uh, metals reflect light. Light can't get in because the photon has a mass inside, so it reflects uh, up to the ultraviolet. And uh, so the, ax the photon mass in a metal corresponds typically to the ultraviolet. Whereas we want to mass in the gigahertz range, way, way down in microwaves. Semiconductors might be a better bet where the electron is smaller, but uh, for a variety of reasons, this hasn't really panned out yet, although we've, we've looked at it and continue to look at it. What does appear to be very workable and quite an exciting possibility is to design materials, so-called metamaterials, that uh, basically are uh, artificial versions of metals that, uh, that can have a plasma mass that's much smaller than in a uh, natural piece of metal. The simplest idea that occurs to me, it occurs to one immediately, if once you start thinking along these lines is, well, instead of using a solid block of metal, just use a bunch of wires with spaces in between, then the electron density will be much less as, as you want. And that turns out to be essentially the winning strategy. Uh, thin wire metamaterials, which are just arrays of thin conducting wires have a plasma frequency and um, they for other purposes they've been designed and used for quite a while uh, and here's what a prototype axion detector looks like you just have a bunch of wires uh, in a metal a, a, a bunch of metallic wires uh, you cool it down, you put it in a very big magnetic field, you instrument it very sensitively, and you've got yourself a promising axion detector. What's the scale of that picture? Centimeters? It varies depending on the frequency range, but it can be anything from uh, a meter to uh, a few centimeters. Thank you. Well here, well, here, in fact, is a more mature version. So that previous one was an existing prototype that's been built at Berkeley. We have variants of that that have been built in Leningrad, where there's a, a, a very uh, 
World Cutting Edge um, Metamaterials Institute. And we also have uh, collaborators in Stockholm who built prototypes. So we have several different prototypes of, of that basic kind. Here's where, where the prototype that uh, will be the next uh, level of sophistication and polish. Uh, and you can see this is the so-called Pathfinder experiment that's been proposed. And the scale is a few tens of centimeters. So all this has to be cooled down and put in, put in a large magnetic field, which uh, limits the, the, the volume you can have, but the, but, but, but the volume is still very substantial uh, on, compared to other experiments to search for oxygen and, and enough to do something very powerful as we'll see in the quantifier. Uh, so as I already indicated, uh, there are th theoretical problems that are fairly definite for what the mass should be, at least in the non-inflationary uh, cosmology of axions. Uh, this <laughs> is designed to show that a lot of work has gone into uh, by many, many collaborations around the world have gone into and, and a lot of, uh, yeah, both astrophysical, black holes, uh, uh, laboratory experiments. This is a gigantic thing at CERN. Uh, and our special purpose detectors, you know, the really different kinds of antennas to, to look for axions. This is the cosmological predicted band where you let F uh, float. And uh, this, is, this is the coupling as a function of mass. If you ask where are, where is the, uh, where are axions providing the dark matter, uh, the, the mass range estimated in the paper that I just showed you corresponds to this blue thing here. And you see that the uh, existing experiments uh, are either too weak <laughs> in terms of their uh, detecting power or in the wrong place to actually uh, home in on that prediction. But uh, this a plasma haloscope, this new idea, seems to uh, team seems to do it very nicely. So it fits fits the bill very nicely uh, because well here's here's again that no here's the uh, the sensitive range that uh, that you can make uh, using things that we've uh, already prototyped. And uh, the uh, and this is the this is the theoretical range of predicted masses here. So we we have uh, we have hope. So the pathfinder will get you here, and then if that works well, uh, you can scale things up without too much expense to uh, to this full experiment. And uh, what I wanted to tell you, and I think I've, I've used up my time. <laughs> so uh, I, I'd love to give you a chance to ask questions. There are many, many things I didn't get to talk about. You know, Axion physics has been developing for a long, long time now, more than 40 years. Uh, and it's really taken off, I would say, in the last five years, where um, because searches for other kinds of dark matter have come up empty, and more and more people have come to appreciate the depth of the arguments for axions, and no alternative has appeared for addressing the strong CP problem, uh, it's become one of the real frontiers of research in fundamental science, and uh, I hope I've given you some some. Uh, sense of of the ferment there. Thank you.
Thank you, Frank. Thank you very much for, uh, for this talk. And you stayed in time perfectly because we have to take into account the many minutes that I used up at the beginning. Right. <laughs> uh, so uh, a few questions have accumulated in the chat and I'm sure that more will come. I see Band has raised question. One of them generated a discussion in the chat. Uh, Band, do you want to continue along this discussion or do you want to go directly to your second question? I'd like to go to the second question. Uh, thanks, Frank, for uh, this um, nice overview of uh, axion physics, although it had to focus on a few topics. Um, yeah. My question on the uh, axion uh, telescope is, in order to be sensitive to different axion masses, do you have to adjust the spacing in the meta lattice? Yes. And if so, how do you do that? Uh, well, you have... A bunch of wires <laughs> and in, in the actual designs there are uh, uh, hundreds or sometimes oh, yeah. thousands of those wires oh. and they're they're on the the thing that seems to be quite effective is you have uh you have them you have uh wires on uh in in frames so you have planar arrangements and uh, you have two rigid frame frameworks, uh, which consist of a bunch of each. Each of them consists of a bunch of pl planes, large number of planes, each of which contains a large number of wires. That, that's all rigid, but you move with one degree of freedom. You move one one of these arrays with respect to the other. That's what seems to work, and that gives you about a thirty percent. Uh, range of uh, variation in frequencies. Quick follow-up uh, question. Um, so you'll have to, to so to cover the whole range, you'll have to build uh, two or three different detectors, but it, sh it looks manageable. Quick follow-up question. In order to, uh, you'll probably have a trade-off between bandwidths of sensitivity and sensitivity itself. How do you yeah. optimize that? Oh, well, that's a long story that I, I, uh, I'm not really competent to talk about, but there are people who, who are on it, you know, people who are very skilled in data analysis. So there's a question of, you know, do you, how long you spend at different frequencies, do you tune broadly or, 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 or narrowly? And uh, yeah, that, that uh, you have to, <laughs> It, it, it's a su subject that's been studied within the collaboration. This is the, the, so the alpha collaboration, which is what I've been talking about. Um, uh, but I, I, I'm not on top of that aspect, I'm sorry. Can, can I use my uh, prerogative yeah. here to continue along this questioning line of questioning? Where will you find the, uh, magnetic, the strong magnetic fields that this uh, pathfinder will go into? Oh, well, there are, there are big, strong magnets uh, in many places around the world. They're used in, in medicine. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, we're, we're talking to many potential places. Uh, okay. in, 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 uh, Fermilab is one, I understand, is one potential customer they, they, or source. They, they have a large magnet. Uh, CERN has many large magnets. The Karolinska Institute in, in Sweden and is a, a medical facility that has <laughs> many magnets and they're always upgrading. So maybe we can get a deal on a used one. And you know, those are big ones because they have to they they put people into them. So 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 yeah. So and uh, a nice thing about this uh, this this design is that uh, we can use uh, solenoids. We don't need dipoles, and so we, so we, so we want to be inside a solenoid. That's that's uh, that's. Thank you. I see, a, see another. Commercially. Yeah. Thank you. I see another question from Fu Zhang. Fu Zhang. Fu Zhang Wang. Uh, yes. Um, my question is about. Um, so so we create a high temperature heavy ion. Uh, uh, coagulant plasma in heavy ion collisions yeah. uh, and, uh, and likely the theta term or theta value or the theta field is uh, non-zero. Uh, 
So have, what can we do? I mean, what's in your mind <laughs> that you can think of things that we can, we can do? Well, that? understanding QCD better is, uh, is, is, will have some influence on uh, pinning down the parameters of axion physics uh, more precisely. Of course, it'll also you know, give confidence in the underlying picture, but at this point, I don't think we need more confidence. We, we, QCD is right. There's, that's not negotiable anymore. Uh, the, uh, 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 but, okay, so uh, as I said, I as alluded to, it's not directly experimental, but maybe you could have cross checks of, of the of the of the uh, of the predictions of lattice gauge theory uh, which are a necessary component to relating the parameters of the fundamental theory in particular the value of f to the observed mass of the axion or the predicted mass of the axion uh, because you know the rough, the rough estimate was lambda QCD squared over F, but uh, what, what you mean exactly by lambda QCD squared is 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 uh, is something that has is, is a much more technical and demanding calculation, and that 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 certainly needs work. And uh, there are enough uncertainties in the lattice calculations that it would be very good to have independent checks of other of their predictions experimentally. So uh, that's, that I think is what uh, could be contributed uh, by, by experiments and, and, and in conjunction with the lattice gauge theory. I, I'm sorry, I can't be more precise about it, but I just haven't put enough thought into it. But, uh, there are people who, Think hard about these things. Uh, the uh, the other the other aspect is that uh, is related to that, probably, which is that the heavy ion collisions produce some approximation, some reasonable approximation, to uh, conditions in the early universe when the temperature was. Uh, uh, maybe hundreds of MeV that are crucial in the, uh, in the evolution of the axion field in the theory. So it would be very good to have uh, checks of the underlying assumptions about matter under those conditions. Okay, okay. thank you. I see one other question related to heavy ion collisions by Vincenzo Greco. Can you go ahead please and ask your question? No, my question at the end is strictly related to the one of Zhang. I was wondering if there is, uh, maybe Frank has not had the time to spend uh, to evaluate it, but if we can expect uh, uh, significant production from the field, the theta zero value, you know, maybe ion collisions or from the quark and gluon oh. scattering. That couple well, of action. I think, or, I mean, a lot of axions do get produced, but probably, I mean, I have at various times look, looked at this, but not very hard because it didn't look very promising. You don't, you don't get enough axions to, uh, mm -hmm. to, yeah, to, to make it practical to try to detect, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you produce conditions as in the early universe, but in a very, very small volume for a very, very short time. So it doesn't, it can't really compete with, uh, with, uh, with, the, with the early universe as a source of axions. So, so I mean, in the, at the LHC, there are experiments that are trying to detect the neutrinos that are created in, uh, in a proton-proton collision. Mm -hmm. But you say the axion problem is orders of magnitude more difficult than this? You, you, make so. lots, you make lots of axions, but it's just so hard to detect them that you, that you gave up. Yeah, I gave up. It's possible I shouldn't have given up, but I did give up. <laughs> uh, so, no, no, I, you know, and anyone who wants to look into it, I encourage them to do so. But I, I would be 
surprised and somewhat mortified. It turned out that that, that, that was uh, that was that that worked out. <laughs> Are there any other questions? I don't see any raised hands and we have run out of comments in the chat. Sabolt, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so much of this discussion was based on uh, the assumption that axions are created at a few GeV temperature um, through a misalignment mechanism. But I vaguely remember there were there was also Many, another. Well, okay. There are not a few. I mean, it's gigantic. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, uh, oh, sorry. Yes, yes. Yeah. The, the transition was so, but that there was a temperature where uh, actions were actually produced. Anyway, um, uh, could it be possible that they were created, or at least this transition, Petchikin transition, was occurred before inflation? Yes. Oh, yes. That was the that, that was scenario B, which I didn't. Um, didn't have time to really discuss. It's definitely possible. <laughs> and then- uh, What, what uh, then follow from that? Well, then you don't, you're not supposed to uh, sample different initial displacements because our whole universe corresponds to one choice of the initial mm -hmm. displacement. And that makes it possible to accommodate larger values of F. Remember, the density is the density today is approximately proportional to F, but it's also uh, proportional to uh, sine squared theta zero, if you like the, the the displacement of of the initial the initial angle, uh, and so you can you can accommodate a large F if we happen to live in a part of the universe where theta started off small. Okay. Different parts of the universe that inflated have different values of theta naught, the, the initial displacement, and we uh, we could happen to live in a place where uh, it started off small, and then you could accommodate larger values of f. That's that's the other cosmological scenario. That actually is a beautiful model, and as far as I'm concerned basically the only concrete model we have of how anthropic arguments could could be important in uh, or could arise uh, legitimately in physics because uh, we have a model that's absolutely standard that we can apply standard techniques of cosmology and particle physics to and the only thing that changes in these different parts of the universe uh, where the misalignment angle is different is the amount of dark matter that you produce in the form of axions. None of the fundamental laws of physics change, just the amount of dark matter. And so uh, you have very, very different conditions in different parts of the multiverse, if you like, that correspond to different values of this theta zero. Uh, but you can actually analyze them because they just amount to having more or less uh, density, dark matter density in the form of axions relative to ordinary matter. And it turns out that if you follow that out, it seems that uh, the larger values of theta zero uh, the larger, yeah, if you have a large value of F, so the default expectation for an average value of theta zero would be much, much more axions in dark matter uh, compared to uh, ordinary matter than we observe. We observe about a factor of six to one in our universe of dark matter to ordinary matter. If it was much larger, however, uh, it would be very difficult for uh, galaxies to condense or to have observers. So you can make anthropic arguments that uh, the uh, it's, it's natural in the context of anthropic uh, arguments. The, if you ask yourself, what would a typical observer see as opposed to what is a typical volume support? Uh, it's very natural 
to have large values of F but small values of the initial displacement. So that's a viable alternative cosmology. Thank you. This line of questioning sparked another question from Christopher Plumber. Chris, can you go ahead? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, thanks for a really nice talk. Um, Thank you. I was inter interested in something that you mentioned earlier on in the talk um, about non or about anthropic implications of taking a large value for the theta parameter. Um, I'm wondering, um, are there some non-anthropic consequences of choosing uh, a large theta parameter? For example, would would taking a large time reversal asymmetry in QCD with this spoil agent causation, for example? Um, would there be other effects? I'm sorry, spoil what? Something like agency, agent causation, or something. So in other words, instead of thinking about anthropic considerations from the standpoint of the universe's inhabitability, maybe there's implica implications related to the universe's intelligibility or something like this. Do you have any comments on that? Uh, it's a mind boggling idea, I guess. The, uh, the, so if I, if I understand it correctly, what you're suggesting is, well, I'm, I'm going to assume that uh, we're uh, uh, in the framework, well, we're, we're in the intellectual framework where we agree that mind is an emergent property of matter, comes from brains. And you, you ask whether brains could operate very, very differently if, uh, if there were more time reverse, more fundamental time reversal symmetry. Sure, or I guess in, maybe, in more, maybe, nature. yeah, maybe, uh, maybe less speculatively, just, just in the sense of are there other observable consequences uh, that choosing a very large time reversal asymmetry like this would imply aside from ruling out? Well, they seem to be pretty, um, I have to say, they seem pretty to be pretty obscure because remember, uh, we're talking about QCD and that in the natural world, that comes down to uh, properties of atomic nuclei. Mm -hmm. And the properties of atomic nuclei are pretty well hidden <laughs> in everyday life uh, because you know they're within electron clouds and chemistry is chemistry operates almost independently of the details of nuclear structure. Uh, now I know I'm I'm speaking very crudely here, but but I if there's a if there's a path to go from time reversal asymmetry in QCD to sort of macroscopic behavior of matter that would make a difference for everyday life, even if the theta parameter were, I don't know, a 10th, a fifth, I don't, I mean, uh, one, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, uh, I think the, there would be noticeable effects for new, in, in nuclear physics, but I, uh, and maybe, uh, T violation would have been discovered in the early 20th century instead of the late 20th century, but I don't see how it would affect everyday life. Okay. Very much, okay. but maybe I'm missing something. No, no, no. And, uh, and, and you'd also, you know, one should also consider possible effects in cosmology and evolution. So hmm. there might be more subtle effects uh, along those lines, but I have a hard time seeing it in the context of everyday life. Uh, how does how should I say? If you regard it as a small perturbation on the existing circumstances, I don't see how it gets amplified in any way. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. There is another question from Fu Zhang. Let me just quickly read it. Uh, so you said that the actions are very light, but you also said at a different point that they are moving non-relativistically very slowly. Why was that? Yeah. Well, it's because they they were produced a long, long time ago as a condensate cosmologically, and they're subject to something called Hubble friction, mm -hmm. which basically is the kinematic effect within general relativity that in an expanding universe, uh, 
uh, things seem to slow down. <laughs> uh, that, that's why things cool, they slow down. And that's what's happened to the axions. I mean, yeah, this can be discussed more precisely, but that's the basic uh, concept. Yeah. I assume that answers your question, Fudan. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I was just thinking that uh, the cosmic background is, you know, three degree, and that's comparable to the mass that you estimated. But if the axions, well, no, but photons are a very different story. Photons are a different story because they can slow down. <laughs> that's, that's uh, yeah. So that, 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 uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So I we are running up to our um, time limit, and also I see. I think the stream of questions has ended. So I think this is a good point to thank you very much again for this inspiring talk. And um, thanks for opening the, this year's seminar series, which is such a beautiful talk. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity and uh, happy new year. Uh, the year of the tiger. Okay, bye now. All right.